right. Uh, so I guess uh, the tutorial today is uh, hypersonics, uh, both in aerodynamics and propulsion, right? Uh, so I have to tell you the truth. And I think this was a difficult endeavor to prepare this, this tutorial, very difficult. Because I see that uh, in the audience there are people with many different backgrounds, right? Uh, um, actually, very few people that I know of that they work on hypersonics in the audience. So, and actually, as you probably know, hypersonics is a very specific topic. It's very specific for very specific applications. And as Parviz was saying, uh, hypersonics is on the rise again for reasons that I'm not going to explain at the beginning, but I'm going to leave at the end uh, to explain why hypersonics is probably on the rise. So what I'm going to do today is actually uh, to do this tutorial very simple. It's very simple. And probably for some of you that you know hypersonics, is, it may look uh, too simple. I'm actually scanning the room to see uh, who's around. Uh, I see, for instance, some of my students in the graduate uh, class of hypersonics, and probably it's going to look even simpler than the, than the class. So, but I think it is also the purpose of this tutorial to teach you the basics, right? Not to me, for me to come here and give you uh, an overload of uh, particularities of the topic, and also because I have to recognize my own limitations, right? Not only your limitations, but also my limitations in uh, telling you about this topic. So I have uh, uh, divided this tutorial in two parts. The first part is going to be related to aerodynamics, and the second part is going to be related to propulsion. So uh, the sources for this tutorial, uh, as Parviz was saying, uh, for more details, you have uh, the annual review article there, together with the number of uh, references that are referenced in that annual review. It's more than five pages of references. And for this tutorial, I actually have plenty of things. I have pictures, I have movies, I have equations, I have handmade sketches. I even have a portion of a uh, known movie, probably you know very well. And I also have a model here that I'm going to pass around because in case that you get bored, right, you can still play with this Apollo 11 uh, model, right? I'm going to pass it to Mike Mueller first. Uh, <laughs> so you can just uh, enjoy yourself there. So you have plenty of choices here to, <laughs> to get distracted with this uh, tutorial. So as uh, probably this is a famous expression, right, from the past uh, that Gene Kranz, the uh, flight mission director for the Apollo 11 mission said, sit tight and prepare for events that are coming, and good luck to all of you. <laughs> so let me just uh, start probably the tutorial 71 years ago. 71 years ago, Chuck Yeager, aboard this airplane that was called X-1, actually broke uh, the sound barrier, which was uh, Mach 1. This was a crucial moment in the history of aeronautics because it's, it enhanced our comprehension of, of transonic flows. And actually, it was the first time that somebody was going into the supersonic regime. So this airplane was very small and actually was powered by rocket engines. Actually, it was powered, the propellants were alcohol and liquid oxygen. The alcohol, besides drinking it, you can actually use it for, for rocket propulsion. <laughs> so this... Uh, 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 in this airplane, Chuck Jagger passed the barrier of uh, Mach 1, and it was a, a fundamental moment for the science community, too, because it was not known back then how an airplane would behave in the transonic regime. And even though he managed to do this uh, historic event, right, aboard this airplane, when he actually landed at the Muroc uh, Air Base, apparently there were not so many people to receive him, here, to receive him, to receive him there. Just one uh, journalist, a couple of journalists there, but no public, because actually the event was kind of classified. So I'm going to let uh, the pilot of the uh, V29, I was actually deploying this uh, airplane to tell you about the, the event.
we could have rewrite the book. And what he meant is that uh, many PhDs from those years, they thought that this event was impossible. And it was impossible because the linearized theory of aerodynamics predicted a singularity in the transonic regime. And actually, there is a nice paragraph from a book right, that tells about that. It says, uh, we call the speed range just below and just above the sonic speed, Mach 1 number nearly equal to 1, the transonic range. Dryden and I invented the word transonic. I will remember this period when designers were rather frantic because of the unexpected difficulties of transonic flight. So the question is, who said this? Are there any volunteers in the audience? Tell me who said this? Von Karman, very well. It was Von Karman in, uh, the, in his book, Aerodynamics. And actually, Von Karman, in his book, he actually also says uh, some uh, uh, nice story about the word transonic, uh, because Dryden uh, actually proposed to use two S's there for transonic, right? And Von Karman said that, uh, you know, once you go for a simple uh, name. So Von Karman actually was describing here a singularity in the linear, uh, in the linearized aerodynamic theory by which the lift uh, will go to infinity and the drag coefficient will go to infinity passing through, through the transonic range. And actually Von Karman was fundamental in uh, formulating a nonlinear theory for transonic aerodynamics. So as you probably know now, what happens in transonic regimes is that uh, if you have an, airf an airfoil like this, even if the airfoil is flying at uh, subsonic speeds, like for instance, here is 0 0.88, what you have on top of the airfoil, for instance, in this side of the airfoil here, you have the generation of a shock wave. This is the uh, mark, the landmark of a transonic uh, aerodynamics. So this uh, uh, shock wave that it generates is uh, an adverse pressure gradient that generates here massive separation, uh, dead air region, and as a result, uh, what happens is that the lift drops dramatically, the drag increases dramatically, there is also a nose down pitch moment of the aircraft, and there is Mach buffeting, and um, back then it wasn't known how to handle all of this, and actually Chuck Jager and the X1, uh, they managed to, to handle all of this by using a movable, a moving horizontal stabilizer in the tail, and that moving horizontal stabilizer, if you go now and you look at an F-16, the F-16 also has a moving horizontal stabilizer in such a way that the entire airfoil moves, rotates, to avoid that uh, shock wave. So this event, for instance, this discovery was classified for many years, uh, and it gave uh, the United States a quantum leap in, uh, in high-speed aerodynamics. So actually, the research on high-speed flight was actually also motivated by, by Von Karman in this country, and his contribution was essential so here, for instance, uh, you have uh, what is called the first letter, right? The letter to, from Von Karman to General Arnold of something that is called the Von Karman Report. And it is that uh, after the Second World War, uh, the General Ar Arnold actually commissioned Von Karman to go around the world, to Germany, to Switzerland, to Japan, together with a set of scientists, 33 scientists, where, for instance, you could find uh, Dryden, Cien, you could find Purcell, for those of you that you work on low Reynolds hydrodynamics, I've also worked on low Reynolds hydrodynamics, but Purcell was also there. George Gamow, uh, many people there of renowned uh, fame in the world of aeronautics and physics. So he went around the world and he collected the wisdom of uh, many other countries and he came back and he wrote a report, a report which was actually 13 volumes and thousands of pages. And that report is today is the set, is the foundations of the United States Air Force and it actually set the research of the United States State Air Force for many years ahead. So in that report, for instance, he writes a sentence here summarizing the report to uh, General Arnold re regarding, uh, for instance, something that uh, was known back then, this is atomic weapons, the necessity of developing atomic weapons. But also here, down here, for instance, uh, he writes that it is imperative for the United States to develop uh, capabilities of pilotless aircraft, all weather flying, perfected navigation and communication, remote control and automatic flight air and bombing forces, and aerial transportation of uh, entire, uh, ent entire armies. So, but uh, on top of that, in the first position of that uh, list is actually supersonic flight. And he was very concerned that supersonic flight could give a lot of advantage to the United States Air Force in a future uh, uh, World conflict. So this uh, supersonic flight uh, statement here of Von Karman actually motivated a lot of research that came after the X-1 and many other airplanes, many other X-airplanes actually that uh, 
were experimental. And the most famous probably was the, the X-15 in 1967 that broke the world speed uh, record, actually, max 6.7. And this was a piece of engineering, uh, this aircraft. Uh, it was also rocket power, right? Uh, and here I'm going to show you uh, probably uh, a summary of uh, what was achieved. Impressive, the description that Pete Knight actually makes of this event. It's actually the, the aircraft was being consumed right, by aerodynamic heating as it was flying hypersonically. And this was in 1967. And ever since, 51 years later, we have not achieved anything as similar as this, as at least anything that we know of. So maybe things that uh, we don't know about, right? Uh, but uh, at least for the public uh, audience, we have not uh, achieved anything similar as this as this 51 years later, this is impressive. So, what makes hypersonic flight so difficult? Well, if I have to summarize here uh, why, probably I will put two reasons. First is hypersonic aerodynamics, is that uh, hypersonic airplanes are subject to high structural loads, to suppress aircraft maneuverability, um, most importantly, to extreme temperatures, and that is called the thermal barrier. And it is, it is different from the sound barrier. It's a different barrier which actually does not have a fixed Mach number, but actually extends until Mach infinity. So for instance, uh, one example of this is uh, the uh, X-15A2, this, this last flight that you were uh, seeing no, of Pete Knight. Uh, actually, it unremarkably carried uh, this uh, device here that you see in the tail. And this device was called a hypersonic research engine. And it happens that uh, back then, uh, the X-15 programs had plans of uh, inserting a scramjet in the airplane. So you see today, nowadays, we are thinking about research on scramjets like numerical simulations, uh, modeling, experience, and so on. But these guys, they wanted to put that scramjet right away, which actually tells you a lot about the boldness of uh, uh, the uh, aeronautical programs back then. So this uh, device here, that was uh, this dummy version of that scramjet, you can see here, right? This is another picture of it. And in this other picture here, which is post-flight, you cannot see it anymore. And you cannot see it anymore because it was lost in flight. And it was lost in flight because of aerodynamic heating, right? And this was the beginning of uh, uh, how aerodynamic heating could actually destroy an aircraft and how the engineers were uh, learning about it. So here you have a picture of the ventral fin uh, where, uh, from where this uh, scramble was hanging, right? Was the scramble will be down here. So here you can see some holes here punched on the ventral fin. And those holes, they are, there are many versions about that. There is also a report written by Watts. But one of the versions is related to shock-shock interference. And that's an important problem in hypersonics. So for instance, here you have an example of shock-shock interference in which you have this uh, uh, inlet uh, spike, let's say the spike of the ramjet. So what will happen will be the following, is that uh, the ramjet has a spike, right? And here it will be the, the pylon, so this old wall. So there is a shock wave emanating from the, sp from the spike. There is a bow shock emanating from the, from the pylon. And at this interaction, that interaction point, then you have a uh, shock-shock interference, 
And what happens is that here the Mach number is very large. The Mach number here is very large. So at this point, what you have is a zoom of that region where you can see that uh, interaction that is called type 4, type 4 interaction, or you see the jet also impinging there. And here you can see a numerical simulation. This is a two-dimensional numerical simulation from the 70s at a much lower Reynolds number. The lower Reynolds number here was about 10,000. But uh, you can see here the uh, uh, solution without impingement and the solution with impingement, right? The peak here, the peak of heat flux is actually at the impingement point. And you can see basically a multiplication of eight or six or eight, the uh, uh, heat flux without any impingement. So this, for instance, a very nice uh, test case for those of you that you're interested in uh, hypersonics, right? For modeling and even for testing your codes and for seeing uh, whether your code can predict uh, hypersonics or so. This is a very nice uh, test case uh, that uh, has received some attention, but probably not as much as the canonical flat plate uh, compressible boundary layers and things like that, because this case is considerably more, more, more involved. So this uh, uh, X-15, as I was saying, was uh, uh, arm was uh, equipped with this uh, scramjet, dummy scramjet, but actually the scramjet was not propelling anything. The, scram the X-15 was actually propelled by a rocket. And the rocket was this uh, XLR-99, which uh, actually had propellants, ammonia and LOX, liquid oxygen. So as you know, rocket engines have uh, uh, advantages and also disadvantages. Um, uh, as we will see later, uh, some of those disadvantages can be overcome by air breathing propulsion. But I will just give you here, I will just show you this video of a test pilot of the X-15 that was actually testing this rocket. And the X-15 is actually attached to the rocket. So the test stand that you're going to see, the pilot is actually inside the uh, X-15. Uh, is attached to the rocket engine. So let's see how the rocket of the uh, X-15 performs. This is a, a Scott Crossfield, is the test pilot. Right, it's a very nice burn. Yeah, so, right, they were not so reliable after all, but, uh, so most importantly, uh, for the purposes of this talk, it's actually that the load of LOX, of liquid oxygen, amounted to 39% of the weight at launch of uh, the X-15. It was actually six tons of LOX that you would have to carry by the time this was dropped by, the, by an F, uh, by a B-52. This 39%, uh, right, is a percentage for the X-15, but I can tell you, for instance, the Falcon 9 in uh, SpaceX, in order to put a load at, uh, a payload at, uh, in low Earth orbit, which is a 23-ton payload, you need to have a weight at the launch pad of 50, 550 tons, right? 
including the entire rocket. And out of those 550 tons, 350 tons are actually liquid oxygen. So you need to carry 350 tons of liquid oxygen to put 20 tons of uh, load payload uh, in low Earth orbit. So the question is, how can one reduce that? Well, it is pretty clear, right? Uh, one concept is using air breathing propulsion. So this actually takes me to the second part of this uh, uh, list that I had. First, hypersonic aerodynamics and second, hypersonic propulsion. These are the two main challenges for hypersonic flight. And in hypersonic propulsion, you need to provide a system, a propulsion system that is capable of uh, having good stability, prolonged burn, low internal drag, thermal management, fuel efficiency, and those are characteristics that are required in order, for, uh, in order to reach hypersonic speeds. So this actually is a good subdivision of my talk here. Let me just go for the first part, which is related to hypersonic aerodynamics. I'm just going to talk about the basics of hypersonic aerodynamics, right? Uh, and the basics starts with the very basics, which is actually this uh, picture here, taken from uh, NASA Langley. This is actually uh, an experimental visualization. And as you probably remember from your compressive flow classes, uh, if this is a shock wave here, there are two shock waves here emanating from the nose. This is, for instance, a horizontal line aligned with the free stream. This is a streamline passing through the shock. The pre-shock gas is at Mach 1, then the post-shock gas is at Mach 2. Then the streamline is going to get deflected into that uh, shock. And there are two fundamental angles here. One is this uh, streamline deflection angle, delta, and the other one is this angle of incidence, beta. Right? Those are two fundamental angles for the de description of shock waves. If I do here some trigonometry, actually it happens that delta is the aperture angle of the nose. Um, beta is actually the separation angle of the shock with respect to the center line of the fuselage. So there is one important uh, thing that one needs to understand in hypersonics, is that hypersonics occurs when the normal Mach number, when the Mach norm number normal to the shock is actually large, right? Is actually large because it is the normal component of the Mach number, the one that is producing the high temperature jump across the shock. So this is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient for hypersonics, or at least for the hypersonic flows that uh, uh, represent the challenge nowadays in aeronautics. So in the limit in which this uh, number is large, and moreover, in the limit in which the square of that number is large, then there are two effects, two simplifications that are worth mentioning. The first one is the density ratio. The density ratio collapses to this expression where gamma is the adiabatic coefficient. And actually becomes six when the gamma is equal to 1.4, which actually tells you that there is a, there is a maximum packing in the post-shock gas. There is a maximum density ratio that can be achieved, right? You cannot go above that density ratio. This maximum density ratio plays a fundamental role in the theory of uh, hypersonics, a fundamental role. And it's actually the cause, the root cause of the failure of uh, the calorically perfect gas approximation in hypersonics. There is also a second consequence of this, and it is that uh, when beta is also, when the angles are small, when the aircraft is slender, beta and delta, they don't differ that much. They don't differ that much. So beta and delta, they are almost the same by a factor of 1.2. So that means that the aperture angle of the shock and the surface inclination angle are mostly the same. Moreover, if I go to these expressions and I let gamma here to 10 to 1, right, because I want to, just as a mental exercise, it will happen that the density ratio will go to infinity. And it will happen that beta will be 1 plus 1, 2 divided by 2, it will be 1. So in the limit of gamma 1, beta and delta are the same. So the shock and the surface of the fuselage are the same in their approximation. So this parameter that is here is called the CN similarity parameter. It's a very famous parameter in hypersonic theory, and it was actually invented by uh, Tien. Uh, Tien was a student of von Karman, and actually wrote the first paper that is known of in hypersonics. And here you have a copy of the abstract of that paper that was published in 1946. And actually, Tien mentions here in the first paragraph that Theodore von Karman has pointed out that in many ways the dynamics of hypersonic flows are similar to Newton's corpuscular theory of aerodynamics. So what does that mean? Well, that means the zeroth order of, of hypersonics. 
the zeroth order of hypersonics is the following, and it was invented uh, tangentially without knowing it by Newton. So the Newton's theory of uh, hypersonic wave drag tells you the following, and it is a theory that is valid when uh, the derivative coefficient tends to one, which you may say, is that physical? Well, uh, it is physical under some considerations that I will tell you later, but you are used to one and uh, 1.4, right? So Newton said that the gas molecules, they look like corpuscles, that they don't actually interact with each other. They don't interact with each other. So they cannot build pressure ahead of, the, of, the, of this flat plate, for instance. They are going to go and collide ballistically against the plate. They are going to go and collide ballistically against the plate. This collision is inelastic, and what it's going to do is to uh, uh, provide some uh, momentum normal to the plate that is going to generate an aerodynamic force. And that aerodynamic force, according to the Newtonian theory, can be actually written like that. That's a surface pressure coefficient that is actually a sine square law, right? It's very simple. It's extremely simple. Uh, it has some limitations, for instance, is that if I go and I try to compute the drag coefficient from that, if I evaluate that, for instance, for, land, for delta equals to zero, it will give me zero drag. And it will give me zero drag because there is no boundary layer inbuilt in this approximation. So there are some limitations to this theory. But I could, for instance, apply this theory to a sphere. And in this theory, when gamma equals to one, as I told you later, uh, the beta and delta collapse, actually the shock wave uh, envelops very closely the surface of the, on this case, the sphere. And in this limit, the shock layer, which is the distance between the, uh, is the layer that lies between the shock wave and the surface of the, of the sphere, will actually have zero, zero thickness. So this is a problem that, for instance, you can give to your graduate students to solve as a homework problem or as an exam problem in some cases for the final exam, right? Uh, and compute, for instance, the drag coefficient. Um, if you compare it to experiments, which is done here on the left, or sorry, on the right, uh, is the free stream back number, and this is for a cone and for a sphere in a ballistic range. These are high or relatively high Reynolds number uh, experiments. Uh, the Reynolds number here is larger than 10 to the 5, and it is there where a uh, collapse or an independence of the drag coefficient is observed. So what you will see, for instance, is the approximation of the Newtonian theory for a sphere, right, here. It has a gap. It doesn't get to the final value, that is this plateau, right? And the same here for a cone. There is a shift. But uh, hey, the numbers are not that bad, because I did this just with the pen and paper in the back of the envelope. So you don't have to run a super simulation to, to get this number unless you want to get it exactly, right? So not that bad, not that bad for such a simple theory, which tells you that there is something here that actually works, and it works because actually these molecules, they are not seeing the, the surface of the spacecraft ahead. And they are not seeing it because, as you probably know, at high speeds, the pressure field is not elliptic. The pressure field actually is not elliptic, so it cannot understand, it cannot notice that there is something there ahead of time, right? It's just going to collide against that. So as you will see here too, uh, these lines, these uh, curves, they actually plateau. And they plateau at very large uh, Mach numbers. And notice too that for a cone, the plateau is achieved later in the Mach number. And it is achieved because of the reasons that I told you before. That the normal Mach number, in order for you to achieve a normal Mach number that is high for a slender body, right? If you have a slender body, slender in a slender body. So that is to say that if you have a cone, which is a slender, it's going to take you a higher Mach number to get it to a independence a regime like this, related to the Mach independence. So in this regime, the quantities, they become independent of the Mach number, and particularly the drag force, the drag coefficient, sorry, the drag coefficient. The drag coefficient because it is related to the pressure field, because this is, this is a wave drag, doesn't contain any friction drag. And as you know, at high Mach numbers, the wave drag, which is the drag caused by the pattern of shock waves, dominates. <laughs> so this uh, Mach independence, right, is crucial also for experiments. If you want to set up experiments, the hope is that the system is going to become independent of the Mach number, so that if you are at Mach 12, it will be the same as Mach 20, right? 
Uh, but you may be envisioning too that uh, if I keep on increasing the Mach number, probably the temperatures are going to rise. So there is something wrong here in assuming an independence of a Mach number because the thermal field for sure is not going to be independent of a Mach number. It's only the pressure field. And actually hypersonics deals with a very complex effect. In order for a hypersonic flow to qualify as hypersonic, uh, to exploit, let's say, the capabilities, the full capabilities of an aerodynamic. High temperatures, thermochemical gas dynamic effects, relatively high, high Reynolds numbers, but not too high, and I will tell you a little bit more about that later, and aerodynamic heating. These are five essential components of hypersonic flows. So these uh, five, these five uh, uh, characteristics, they are actually achieved in uh, stratospheric and mesospheric flight in the terrestrial atmosphere, right? Because the terrestrial atmosphere is a very particular environment. If I mention these five points here, it doesn't mean that in another atmosphere you have these uh, five points there. But uh, hypersonics sometimes is tied to the, to the problem that we have or to the environment that we have here on Earth, which is the terrestrial atmosphere. So let's just talk about the high Mach numbers, and we'll tell you something about the velocity range that we are handling here. For instance, you have velocities of the order of uh, 1,500 meters per second to 14,000 meters per second. And for the use-based people, here I'm also giving you the same number in miles per hour, 3,400 miles per hour and 31,000 miles per hour. And for the Europe-based people, 5,400 kilometers per hour and, four, and almost 50,000 uh, kilometers per hour. So if you are driving in your car at any of these speeds, so you will get a very, a very huge ticket here. <laughs> so the Mach numbers uh, are from 5 to 40 plus, right? These are the type of velocities that we are handling here. It's a very, very high speed velocity, here, very, very high speed flows. For instance, examples of flight times at Mach 10, we have, for instance, from San Francisco to Moscow, 45 minutes to go there in 45 minutes. Now, not accounting for the acceleration period or anything like that, but at 45 minutes, uh, Mach 10. One complete turn around the equator, 3.4 hours, right? Very nice. So all these uh, velocities, they're actually very, very uh, small. Very, sorry, all these velocities here on the upper range that are re-entry velocities are very large compared to the rotational velocity of the Earth, are very large. So the rotational velocity of the Earth at the equator is about 400 meters per second. So uh, for re-entry purposes, this velocity dominates any relative motion that you could cancel with the motion of the atmosphere. So let me just drive this first part of a, of a uh, uh, topic here, which is aerodynamic, uh, hypersonic aerodynamics with this picture here. So what I did was to go to these uh, papers here, where you have the uh, uh, trajectories of each one of these missions, and I plot here in a altitude flight speed diagram the different trajectories of these missions. So for instance, here you have the Apollo command module, right? By the way, I'm putting here uh, some weird uh, units for the following reason. This is in kilofeet, which for uh, people from Europe it maybe look uh, very, very weird. And this flight speed in kilofeet per second. The reason why we use flight speed in kilofeet per second is because the uh, speed of sound in the stratosphere at 35 kilometers of altitude is actually 1,000 feet per second. So if you read this number here, this number means the Mach number 20, Mach number 20 in the stratosphere. It's a characteristic Mach number. So directly you can read the, a characteristic Mach number from this axis. So for instance, you have the Apollo trajectory, which uh, uh, it used to develop uh, some uh, small skip that uh, for purposes that are probably I don't have time to explain. The shuttle orbiter trajectory, which uh, looked more shallow, uh, in this red color. And then here trajectories of the uh, X-43, Hi-Fire 2, X-15, and X-51. Those are rocket, those are uh, uh, chemically powered uh, uh, aircraft, right? These are just re-entry re -entry spacecrafts, both Space Shuttle and the, uh, and the Apollo command module. These two velocities that you have here, the uh, 
first cosmic velocity and the second cosmic velocities, those are velocities that emerge from the astrodynamics theory. Um, for instance, just to give you here uh, uh, schematics, this is uh, handwritten schematics, because it's sometimes difficult to distinguish with PowerPoint. But uh, here, for instance, you will have the uh, incoming mission, the incoming trajectory for the Apollo command module, right? Uh, it's a hyperbolic, typically hyperbolic trajectory that would encounter the fringe of the atmosphere, and then it would re-enter there. And for instance, this circular orbit would be the circular orbit of the space shuttle that uh, in order to re-enter, it requires a de-boost uh, maneuver and then a descent ellipse into the atmosphere. These are the reference monographs for uh, studying the, the trajectories. This could be a good, very nice uh, topic for a future tutorial, right? This paper is written by Lee Chapman, who I believe he was one of the first supervisors of uh, Barbies at NASA Ames. So let me just go back to this. Uh, this first cosmic velocity is just a circular orbit velocity, which is about 7.9 kilometers per second, right, around the Earth. The second cosmic velocity is actually the hyperbolic velocity, which is about 12, 12 kilometers per second around the Earth. Those are very, very high velocities. There are third and fourth cosmic velocities to escape from the solar system and from the galaxy that I won't tell you about, but uh, they are there. So. The hypersonic range starts here at Mach 5. And why at Mach 5? Because uh, I'm capable of uh, guaranteeing more or less that, uh, for instance, uh, a slender body with an angle of 11 degrees is going to see a normal Mach number, which is going to be slightly larger than 1. So that will be a, a way of uh, defining that boundary, even though that boundary is not hard. It's a boundary that you could define as much as, as, as you like. Then here we have the stratosphere, right? The stratosphere is a region in which the temperature actually increases with, uh, with uh, altitude. And this is where all these vehicles, they are flying. The high fire X-43A, S-15, and so on. The uh, characteristic pressure and density, the characteristic pressure in the stratosphere at the edge of the stratosphere is of the order of millibars, right? It's similar to the pressure that you would encounter in Mars. Then above that, you have the mesosphere. It is in the mesosphere where all the aerodynamic heating and the deceleration of re-entry spacecraft peaks. All the action happens here in the mesosphere for uh, re-entry spacecraft, mo most of it. Whereas for this uh, uh, powered aircraft, most of the action happens in the stratosphere. So above that, we have the Karman line, which is at 90 kilometers or 300,000 feet where the density is actually very small. We are talking now about uh, 1,000 of a millibar for pressure. This Karman line was established by von Karman too, and it was established in one, in one line in one of his books, where he didn't give that much of a, of a justification of why that is that. And it happens that uh, he defined that as uh, the line or the altitude in which the, uh, the uh, drag, sorry, the lift, is capable of sustaining only a 2% a 2% of the gravitational pull, right? So the rest, the 98% is actually supported by the centrifugal force. So it is at this altitude where the lift cannot operate anymore. So the students of my class, they actually got to, to derive a more, probably more rigorous uh, definition of the Karman line that has to do with the, with the infinite slope point of this curve, of a curve similar to this, which is the aerodynamic lifting power curve. So above this Karman line, you have uh, the astrodynamics field. Below, you have aerodynamics. To the right, you have supercircular orbits. Those are hyperbolic orbits. Here, you have uh, the region of power flight, right? Where, uh, for instance, in the second part of this tutorial, we talk about the uh, everything propulsion. Here, you have a region that is largely unexplored, and this represents basically the technological challenge for high speed propulsion, it is this region here, because this is a region that involves high Reynolds numbers and high Mach numbers. And in this region, everything is too fast and it is too hot. And this region cannot be accessed presently because it represents a thermal barrier. It is in those regions, for instance, where uh, wall models and high Reynolds number turbulence would encounter in full-fledged uh, high speed uh, phenomena hypervelocity phenomena that has been largely unexplored. So we also have here a, a region, right? 
a barrier up here which is related to oxygen starvation for uh, scrambled engines. And we also have here a barrier that uh, it is too slow. The, any flight here to, it would be too slow because the lift would not be capable of supporting the weight of the spacecraft. So we have these uh, different uh, barriers here. Just to give you an idea of uh, uh, the uh, problem that we are handling here, I'm just going to give you an example of uh, kinetic energies that are involved in hypersonics. Imagine for a second that I have this bar, right, that is made of tungsten. This tungsten has a high density material, right? And I'm going to assume that this bar is traveling to the right at Mach 10. So it has a length of five meters and a diameter of 30 centimeters. I would develop here a shock, right? And I'm interested in calculating the kinetic energy of this. Well, the kinetic energy of this, if I compute it, it would give me 39.4 gigajoules. So it's a very large kinetic energy, right? And if I go and I, for instance, convert that to tons of TNT, it would give me 10 tons of TNT. And this is actually similar to a thermobaric bomb or a small tactical nuclear weapon. So just because of this bar, right, moving at uh, Mach 10, I would attain a similar energy to one of these uh, things here. But it's impressive because uh, you can use, actually, you can make a use of uh, hypersonics, a bad use of it, right? And something that has, ambition, has been ambition for many years, right? Which is launching these bars from space. This will give you, for instance, a very good excuse for a space force that you are you're seeing these days in the, in the news. But I will tell you something, and it is that in order to launch one of these bars, which is a, about six tons to orbit, if you take the price of, uh, of uh, this $20,000 per uh, kilogram, I believe, of uh, payload, it will cost you $130 million to launch just one bar to low Earth orbit. So this is not gonna happen for any foreseeable future, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so let me just tell you another thing, and it is that uh, these high kinetic energies are very important for uh, the stream temperatures. And for instance, uh, I like to understand the Mach number, not only as a ratio of velocity, but also as a ratio of energies. So as uh, you are used to, for instance, to your compression flow classes, the Mach number is just the ratio of the velocity of the flow to the speed of sound. because across a shock, the, stati the stagnation enthalpy is constant. So ahead of the shock, uh, the static enthalpy is negligible because everything is uh, kinetic energy because of the high Mach numbers. And downstream of the shock, the kinetic energy is negligible because the shock is very strong. So that means that the temperature is actually very large and it diverges with the velocity. And actually, downstream from the shock, I have a, a zone which is a kinetic energy recovery zone, which I'm actually recovering all the kinetic energy into thermal energy. This causes here a very, very high temperatures, and here I'm listing some of those temperatures. For instance, 3,000 kelvins for a Mach 10 power flight, 6,000 kelvins for a return from low Earth orbit, or 10,000 kelvins for interplanetary or lunar return. Those temperatures are real. They are not computed with the calorically perfect gas approximation. Those are actually real temperatures uh, downstream of a shock in those conditions, but those are not the temperature of the wall of the surface of a spacecraft. Fortunately, the temperature of the wall of the spacecraft is much lower, and it is because also the spacecraft is radiating uh, heat, right? So the spacecraft is actually achieving an equilibrium temperature that is, lower, that is lower than that. This is very important. These uh, stagnation enthalpies are actually very important uh, for, for what follows. And it is that, for instance, these stagnation enthalpies can reach up to five uh, millijoules, megajoules per kilogram, 35 megajoules per kilogram for return from, from low Earth orbit, and 75 mega megajoules per kilogram on the return from uh, lunar missions. 
I could actually write this uh, diagram in dimensionless form, right? You may be thinking, why is he not uh, using a Dan Keller number here or something like that or a dimensionless number? Well, it happens that uh, when one uh, puts all the parameters into the problem, you don't end up with just one parameter. In hypersonic flows, in the real flows, you actually have several of these scales and you would end up with uh, several of these Dan Keller numbers. So sometimes in the community, we use this uh, stagnation enthalpies to uh, describe the phenomenon. Actually, the stagnation enthalpies, they are tied also to the terrestrial atmosphere. So compare, for instance, this uh, stagnation enthalpies to uh, characteristic latent heats, for instance, for water, vaporization, two megajoules per kilogram, and for carbon, sublimation, right? 60 megajoules per kilogram. So with one of these uh, enthalpies, 75, you could sublimate carbon. So it's amazing, it's a very high energy flow. So these high enthalpies actually what they enable is something that is the culprit of hypersonics, which are the thermochemical effects. And they are tightly uh, dependent on this, uh, uh, the value of those stagnation enthalpies that I show you. And it is because here uh, at small Mach numbers, at Mach numbers of smaller than uh, three or four, right, nothing happens. So, for instance, all the theory of compressible boundary layers, of compressible turbulence using perfect gas approximation, sorry, calorically perfect gas approximation with constant CP, with the ideal gas equation, and all of that, it would uh, be valid there, right? So you could use your, your codes to, to, to simulate this, for instance, and write your theories. Well, beyond Mach 3 or 4, then you will be encountering phenomena that is activated by those high temperatures that I showed you. The high temperatures are essential for thermochemical effects in hypersonics are essential. The first one that appears is vibrational excitation. So that means uh, non-perfect effects. Those are effects that are related to the vibration degrees of freedom of the molecules, of the gas molecules, right? As you know, a gas molecule can have a translational degree of freedom. It can also rotate, it can also vibrate, and the electrons can also change orbits, right? Those are internal degrees of energy or internal modes of energy that are present in a molecule. So here, in this region, the vibrational excitation is excited first, and that means, for instance, that the specific heat is no longer constant. It's going to depend on temperature. Beyond that, at Mach uh, from 5 to 7 or so, approximately, you start having oxygen dissociation. So that means that the oxygen molecules of the air, they are going to break apart and they are going to dissociate into two atoms of oxygen, which are actually very highly reactive. They are very highly reactive. They can react with surfaces. Then beyond that, you have nitrogen dissociation. At Mach uh, 15, Mach 12, Mach 15, would start uh, nitrogen dissociation, the same for the uh, nitrogen molecules. And even beyond that, you will have uh, ionization, right? As that would generate a plasma sheath around the aircraft that at, in some instances, it can actually be problematic for the radio communications in re-entry. I, I think you probably have heard about the communications blackout during re-entry, even in the Apollo 13 movie, right? When they cannot communicate with the spacecraft and it is due to the plasma sheath that develops around the spacecraft. So all these processes, there is a beauty with all these processes and is that they all consume energy. They are all endothermic, right? So what they do is to subtract energy from the, from the post-shock gas, right? They actually subtract energy from the post-shock gas. And that's very important. Above this uh, Mach 10, uh, there is a regime that is called hypervelocity and those are uh, velocities in which the dissociation is important, right? So when we call a hypervelocity, it means very challenging flows. They are beyond hypersonic flows. So this uh, equilibrium, this uh, chemical effect, they can be present either in thermochemical equilibrium or in non-equilibrium, right? And I guess probably by now everybody knows what uh, chemical equilibrium means, right? Uh, to some extent, it is equivalent to infinitely fast chemistry, right? And thermodynamic equilibrium is equivalent to having the molecular degrees of freedom or the molecular modes of motion statistically reordered or statistically according to a Boltzmann distribution. Right? So uh, basically per, the, per energy level, each energy level, uh, given the total energy of the molecule, has different ways of configurating in itself. For instance, you could have certain energy in translation, certain energy in rotation, certain energy in vibration, and so on. So the thermodynamic state that is in equilibrium state, which I could define, for instance, in this room, because it is more or less at rest, is a thermodynamic state in which the uh, state that is observed has the maximum number of those small combinations, has the maximum number of those small combinations, and that corresponds to a Boltzmann distribution. 
uh, distribution is monotonic, monotonically decreasing with temperature. Right? So, for instance, calculations that can be made with thermochemical equilibrium, well, are these, for instance, for a normal uh, shock wave, in which here I have the flight speed and here the post shock temperature. The dashed line actually corresponds to the calorically perfect gas approximation, and this uh, shock, this uh, other profile here, they represent thermochemical equilibrium solutions of the problem, including chemistry and including uh, vibrational excitation. So, as you can see here, there is a large departure from the temperature that would be predicted using uh, thermochemical equilibrium from the temperature that you would predict with calorically perfect gases. And in some sense, right, at some uh, velocities, actually the error, the error can get to 100%. 100% of error in the prediction if you use a CP constant in your calculations. So, as you can see also here, the uh, uh, temperature decreases with altitude, and it decreases with altitude, the post shock temperature decreases with altitude because with altitude, these thermochemical processes of uh, dissociation and ionization, they actually become more important because the pressure decreases, right? So the rarification in the pressure actually exacerbates those thermochemical effects, which actually adds more challenge to the hypersonic endeavor. So those, uh, uh, one thing I was going to say too here is that uh, even though the temperature looks very different, the pressure, if you were to uh, calculate the pressure, the post shock pressure does not look that different. And that connects with the good results that I was showing you later with the zero order theory. And is that the pressure field typically is a is a field that it is dominated by the, by the dynamic pressure of a free stream and nothing else. And that is because of the conservation of momentum through a, through a shock. So the pressure field tends to be always well predicted and the pressure field at high Mach numbers imposes the wave drag. So the challenge is with the temperature and with the density ratio. So there are other effects, right? These, ef these uh, 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 thermochemical effects can also fall into the non-equilibrium arena. And that uh, non-equilibrium arena includes finite rate chemistry, includes uh, ra ra radiative non-equilibrium, non-equilibrium energy modes of uh, molecular motion and so on. So these are situations in which the uh, system is far or is, uh, not, is relatively far from thermodynamic equilibrium and from, um, from chemical equilibrium. So one needs to be careful in, in handling this uh, scenario, right? And there are advanced tools to do that. Here you have uh, some uh, reference treatises on this subject, both uh, Chul Park's book and this paper by Hornung, which I believe is very interesting for people working on transition. Because Hornung here, he gives uh, first steps that were later pursued by Yvette, by Yvette Leiva, for, uh, for instance, suppressing transition, uh, injecting uh, CO2, for instance, into air. Because CO2, uh, the vibrational degrees of freedom of CO2, can actually uh, drain energy during the non-equilibrium period, can actually drain energy from the transition instability modes. In this case, it will be the second mode, the Mach mode, the acoustic mode. It can actually drain acoustic energy from the system and delay transition. So this is a very nice reference that you can uh, look for. So the uh, thermochemical equilibrium is actually enhanced by high temperatures, and this connects also with the combustion system. High temperatures means more collisions, and you'll be pushing the system towards equilibrium, so that means a, an easier problem. The equilibrium phenomena is enhanced by low pressures, or equivalently by high altitudes, and by high velocities. So systems that are at the fringe of the atmosphere, they tend to display uh, non-equilibrium effects over the entire, over the entire uh, profile of the spacecraft. So actually very challenging. All these non-equilibrium effects are due to a deficit of molecular collisions, or what is the same, a finite and killer number in the system, the unclear number defined by the, uh, uh, as the ratio of the flow time scale divided by the characteristic non-equilibrium time scale, which one has to go and define it more carefully as I'm doing here. Uh, that would actually require a quarter, another quarter, entire quarter of a, of a class dedicated to this. So let me just show you, for instance, a profile of a shockwave in non-equilibrium with thermo thermochemical non-equilibrium. So a shock wave in non-equilibrium looks like this, looks like this structure. You will recover a high temperature spike downstream from the shock that you could compute to some approximation with the ranking one solution. The same for the density ratio, which will be somehow similar to that density ratio of six that I was showing you before. And then the temperature would slowly decay down to the equilibrium, to the equilibrium value. Just for you, those of you that you are interested in asymptotic analysis, 
the problem of a shock wave in thermochemical equilibrium is actually a singular perturbation problem. And it's a singular perturbation problem because the, the, the shock jump conditions will tell you that the conditions downstream from the shock, actually for instance here, the composition downstream from the shock by definition of the shock jump conditions is actually the same as upstream. That would tell you, that would be the ranking Huonian solution, which actually tells you that you cannot achieve immediately equilibrium right after the shock. So you need a relaxation distance. So you were to see this structure from your office in Herring Hall, it would look like an equi equilibrium structure, but if you zoom it, you have this uh, non-equilibrium region, which actually extends up to 0 0.1 or 10 centimeters. It's a, it's a long uh, equilibration distance. For instance, uh, uh, one can compute some of these uh, profiles. What happens in, in non-equilibrium dynamics is that uh, the vibrational, the translational, and the rotational degrees of freedom in the, in the gas, they actually fall out of equilibrium. Most of you, in all your calculations, you are dealing with transla translational and rotational non-equilibrium because those are related to viscosity, right, to thermal conductivity, and to bulk viscosity. Right? If you are dealing with those effects, you have translational and rotational non-equilibrium. But those uh, translational and rotational non-equilibrium, they are actually uh, very fast to equilibrate, and they take uh, very few collisions. The vibrational uh, non-equilibrium, on the other hand, takes much longer distance. It takes a much longer distance downstream from the shock. And it, it is because it has to interact with the translating bath of molecules, right? So for instance, here, uh, from this paper, from this review paper of uh, Leiva, the calculations are from other, these two other researchers, Grover and Swanser Truber. You can see these temperature profiles for the translational temperature, for the rotational temperature, and for the vibrational temperature that I believe they are computed with a pseudo-molecular dynamics uh, simulation. That is why they are probably weekly. So these uh, 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 translational rotational temperatures, they become equilibrated uh, uh, rather soon, right? They collapse rather soon, and later the vibrational temperature uh, takes a longer distance to equilibrate with the with the other two temperatures in order to have a only one temperature in the system, only one temperature in the system. So pay attention because these vibrational temperatures, they can actually interfere. They can actually interfere with the kinetics, with the chemical kinetics of the hypersonic flow. And there are very complex models to deal with uh, these mixed effects. Mixed effects in rotational non-equilibrium, chemical kinetics and vibrational non-equilibrium. If you, for instance, you try to evaluate here a rate constant, right, an Arrhenius rate constant, like A multiplied by minus EA divided by RT. The question is, what temperature do I put there in the reaction constant? Well, there is an entire theory for that, and some of you in the audience may know about it, that is called the uh, Schull-Parks theory for two temperatures. At least two temperatures, you can have more than two, uh, where uh, here you will have some sort of uh, Let me go back to this diagram. So in this diagram, I go again and I have this uh, altitude flight speed diagram that you have seen. And here I'm putting the flight time, right? This is the mission time of each one of these trajectories. The mission time is also very important because it is not only the stagnation enthalpy, it's how long a spacecraft is, is uh, taking to, to traverse one of these trajectories. So for instance, you have uh, around uh, 1800 seconds for re-entry of a shuttle orbiter, 1100 seconds for the Apollo command module, and 20 to 200 seconds for uh, this uh, propelled uh, hypersonic aircraft. So you may say, well, these look like very short times, right? Relatively short. Well, I think the uh, shuttle orbiter and the Apollo command module, they can travel thousands of miles during that uh, period, during that time period and the X-51 and the X-43, they can actually travel hundreds of miles during those two 20 to 200 seconds. So that's something to take into account. It's actually the distance, the distances that are covered by these mission times are actually very, very long. So these uh, mission times and the stagnation enthalpies, they are also the culprit of uh, experimental diagnostics. So here I'm giving you a diagram in which I have the stagnation enthalpy in the vertical direction and the test time in the horizontal direction. So you have here the different boundaries for vibration, dissociation, dissociation of nitrogen, and ionization. And here you have different devices that are used to, 
to measure hypersonic phenomena through the shock tubes of the type that you have here in the high temperature gas dynamic lab, the gas dynamics lab here in Stanford that are typically used for kinetics only, right? Because they have very short uh, test times. Then you have also shock tunnels. Shock tunnels are a little bit more sophisticated and they involve the breakage of uh, diaphragms, right? With a driver and a driver with a driver and a driven section and then sweeping that uh, high velocity gas into a test section. Those are high enthalpy or impulse facilities that they are capable of testing about one milliseconds, right? To uh, very high enthalpies, right? Uh, they involve uh, probably the most powerful uh, uh, wind tunnels that are here in this country and in other countries too, in the LR and in Australia. So you also have here blown down tunnels. Those are tunnels that they are activated by uh, high pressure reservoirs and low pressure reservoirs and those are intermittent tunnels, right? Those are intermittent tunnels in which you are just blowing high pressure into low pressure air. Those are involved also uh, NASA La Langley Research Center, the Arnold Engineering Development Center, also DLR's uh, uh, devices and also von Karman's uh, wind tunnels. So uh, these are, with a little bit here, you can see the lips of the uh, blowdown tunnels. They are down here with a much lower uh, stagnation enthalpy and a little bit higher uh, or larger uh, test time. These are typically used for scramjets too, right? This uh, NASA large, NASA Langley Research Center wind tunnels, they are used for scramjets. Sometimes these uh, tunnels, they also involve uh, heating up the, the air. And um, for in order to heat up the air, you could, for instance, uh, heat it up with an electric discharge, discharge or you could heat it up with a uh, combustion. And that's a problem for scramjet testing because if you put something that is a combustion product into a scramjet engine, well, the uh, combustion is going to be affected by that. So that's a topic of research these days of what is the, the effect of these uh, facilities into the, the final solution. Also the noise of this facility, right? Which is in the transition, for instance, is very sensitive to, to the noise in the facility. So that's another, another topic of uh, current research. Well, you also have here arc jet tunnels, right? For instance, here in NASA Ames, you have one. Also the plasmatron with a little bit lower Reynolds number in uh, VGI, those are used for testing thermal, prote thermal protection systems. Those are high enthalpy facilities with uh, relatively long uh, test times. And then you have continuous wind tunnels uh, that they are very low uh, stagnation enthalpy with a very long uh, test time. It is important to, to emphasize here that the stagnation enthalpy is very important for the development of hypersonics, for the development of hypersonic flow. Because what I, what I could do here is to decrease the temperature of the air, right, or the gas, decrease it very much, decrease it very much such that the Mach number is very large, right? If very close to liquefaction, I put the gas very close to liquefaction, I will have a very high Mach number. Uh, that that uh, is convenient for this, uh, facilities down here, but they do not trigger, they do not trigger the thermochemical effects that are the culprit of hypersonics. So many experimental data sets, they are actually based on, on performing this trick, right? But uh, those are also limitations of, uh, of experimental facilities. Well, the most important part of this is that the challenge lies up here, right? Both for interplanetary missions that live up here, uh, long, long uh, mission times and also high enthalpies for re-entry from low Earth orbit that lies over there and for continuous hypervelocity flow. So as you can see, there is a hole here in this corner that needs to be filled. So we are looking for candidates in the audience. So let me just uh, go back to the diagram and write it in terms of the Reynolds number and the Mach number because you may be more happy with, the, with these two parameters, right? We are most used to, to it. So in this diagram, you have the, uh, in the vertical axis, you have the, uh, free stream Reynolds number, right? Based on a characteristic length. This is something that uh, it has its limitations, right? Because locally the flow may be different or the characteristic Reynolds number in each part of the space trap may be different from this one. You may have to look at the, at the flow, but let's say that globally, this is a free stream Reynolds number and this is the Mach number. So here you can see different trajectories and this elbow that uh, you see here, for instance, for the shuttle orbiter and the Apollo command module, it is due to the to the increase in temperature in the thermosphere, in the thermosphere. So this elbow here is uh, due to the fact that the speed of sound increases in the thermosphere because the thermosphere, even though it is the temperature there is probably not very meaningful, but the temperature up there 
uh, the data says that it is about 1,000 Kelvin, so the Mach number is going to decrease. The speed of sound is actually going to increase. So this elbow here that is due to the thermosphere, right? Then you have an entry of the uh, Apollo command module up to Reynolds numbers of the order of 10 to the 6. And the space shuttle orbiter here up to Reynolds number also in the ballpark of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8. And all these uh, chemically propelled, propelled aircraft in the same ballpark, right? Well, uh, remarkably, the Reynolds number that it needs, that each one of these spacecrafts is need, it needs to traverse, <coughs> it needs to pass through a transition point, which is the decisive moment in the trajectory. Uh, let me show you, for instance, let me isolate here the space shuttle, just to give you an example. <laughs> if I isolate here the space shuttle trajectory, I'm going to use this uh, experimental data published in this paper. The transitional flow along the spine, the uh, down the bottom spine of the space shuttle happens in this region here. It happens during 300 seconds, and it happens from Mach 10 to Mach 6. That is where you have a transition region on the surface, and on the surface of the, of the bottom uh, spine of the, of the space shuttle. On the right, you have all laminar flow during 1,000 seconds, right? So, and here on the left, you have turbulent flow during 500 seconds. So you will see that uh, the laminar portion of the flow, the, or the mission, is actually considerable, it's actually significant. And moreover, most of the heat and most of the deceleration is actually uh, performed typically during the laminar, during the laminar uh, portion of, of the trajectory. So here, for instance, on the right, I'm giving you measurements of trajectories, measurements of transition. This is the temperature profile, the temperature history, right, at one point along the spine. So here you have the fore body, a location at the fore body, and a location at the aft body. So you can see that the uh, temperature increases and increases along this portion, right, and increases because of uh, aerodynamic heating that has nothing to do with transition. And then it reaches a point here close to Mach uh, 10, sorry, to Mach 6, in the uh, fourth body where uh, transition happens and the temperature increases, but the increase in temperature is not that large. It's not that large compared to the accumulated temperature that you were seeing before. Now, if you go to the rear part of the spacecraft, which is subject to a smaller temperature because the no shock is more oblique, then what you will see is that the temperature increases, but then the transition spike actually gets to the maximum temperature of 970 Kelvin. So that means an instantaneous uh, thermal load to the spacecraft that is important there. So this is something to take into account, that it is that uh, the spacecraft is actually undergoing a lot of aerodynamic heating even in the laminar region. So there is a lot of research too uh, dedicated to that region. This was, by the way, a uh, roughness-induced transition uh, in flight. So let me just tell you something about the re-entry of the space shuttle. So I took my notebook and I said, uh, my pen and paper, I said, what is the kinetic energy of the space shuttle during re-entry? Right? So the characteristic kinetic energy increment of the space shuttle, if I take one half of the mass at 100 tons and multiply by the characteristic velocity of re-entry, square, it will give me 3.1 terajoules. That's the amount of energy that somehow needs to go somewhere, right? It needs to go somewhere. So where does it go? Well, I said, let me look at my electric bill. <laughs> so if I go to my bill, right, and I say, what's my PG and E bill? I actually consume nine megajoules per day. So if I were able to recover this energy, I would actually have free heating and electricity for 900 years. <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, that would be very nice, right? So this cannot, obviously, I cannot recover this energy, and most of this energy, by the way, is lost. It's lost. And one person that computed this was another famous person in NASA Ames, right? Was a former director of NASA Ames, which was uh, Julian Allen. And here he's posing here a pro picture in front of uh, this blackboard with a formula up here, which uh, I believe is missing a one half, because in some of his papers, he actually has a one half in front of us. But in any case, that's, that's, the, that's the formula that actually gives you an estimate of a fraction of energy absorbed as heat into the spacecraft structure. That's the characteristic fraction that is absorbed as heat. 
So that is to say the following. If I look at this formula, right, it will give me a mean uh, friction coefficient multiplied by a weighted surface S divided by a drag coefficient um, divided by a frontal area. So if I want, for instance, to minimize the amount of heat that the spacecraft is absorbing, what I need is a high drag and a high frontal area. Large high drag and large frontal area, right? So we need something like this, which is, I don't know what did you guys do with my model, but the Apollo capsule model, but it actually resembles that, right? I hope you return it to me. <laughs> for the so this will be uh, the design for minimizing the, the, the heat. For instance, if I, take the if I take in the same mission, for instance, in a shallow entry, this other device here, which looks pointy, this other device will have a high friction coefficient, a low uh, drag coefficient, and actually it will be absorbing a lot of heat to the point that it will melt. So this other uh, body here cannot, for instance, uh, withstand a shallow entry of long duration in the atmosphere. So for that reason, this uh, body here on the right is designed for a slow and shallow uh, atmospheric penetration, right? So that's for instance for manned missions, right? Because it leads to a low deceleration high in the atmosphere, uh, aerodynamic heating also happening high in the atmosphere, and relatively low uh, friction heat fluxes. Whereas this other body here will resemble an intercontinental ballistic missile that is actually penetrating in the atmosphere very fast and it is subject to very high friction heat fluxes. So this is the dichotomy in hypersonic uh, spacecraft design. Now, how is this uh, aerodynamic heating produced? Well, let me just give you some basics that you may know, but it doesn't, it is, it doesn't it's not bad if we, we actually remember some of the basics. Yeah. So for instance, I could have uh, aerodynamic heating due to friction heating, to friction heating, right? Uh, due to the boundary layer up there uh, and up here, for instance. The boundary layer edge that I'm plotting here, right? With a static temperature at the edge, that is TSAB, and a wall temperature TW. If I go and I plot the solution for low Mach numbers, I will have a monotonic uh, temperature profile like this. This monotonic temperature profile, what it would take me, what it would tell me is that actually the surface is getting cooled, getting cooled down by the flow, right? It's getting cooled down by the flow. Well, this actually resembles a problem that was famous uh, many years ago. Uh, it's a problem that actually assigned for the final exam in the hypersonics class. And it's a problem related to how the Babylonians used to cook eggs. And that was treated also by Galileo and by Horacio Grassi. And it has to do with the fact that uh, Horacio Grassi claimed that the Babylonians used to cook eggs by putting them in a sling and rotating them, whirling them very fast. And that was written in a, visa, in a in an encyclopedia from the Byzantines, that this uh, X could be cooked like that. So Horacio Grassi actually justified that the comets, they had bright tails because the Babylonians used to do this with the, with the X. So Galileo actually went, he took the egg, he whirled it in, uh, in air very fast, he took it, and the air actually was not cooked, it was raw. It was, uh, so he said, there is actually absolutely no way of cooking an egg like that. Moreover, let me do the following. If I go and I boil the egg, right? If I boil the egg and I whirl it, and if I look at the egg, if I take it, it's going to be colder. It's actually colder because it's getting cooled down. So this was uh, this uh, quarrel or this uh, clash with, the, with Horacio Grassi, which was a Jesuit priest, was actually important for the trials of Galileo later in his life. And he was in this due because of his problem of the egg that actually he wrote uh, an aside that was called Sagiatore, establishing the scientific method that we know today, that uh, you need to have experiments and a theory in order to prove a to prove something in a science, right? So this is a famous uh, uh, problem that I actually passed on to the students of the hypersonics class and I said, well, what happens if you move the egg at hypersonic speeds, <laughs> right? If you move the egg at, at, at hypersonic speeds, right? This thing wouldn't happen. And actually what you have is a spike in the, in the temperature profile due to the viscous dissipation, due to the viscous dissipation in the boundary layer. That viscous dissipation will cause an, a spike in the in the in the velocity in the temperature profile for sufficiently high uh, Mach numbers, such that the wall temperature becomes comparable to the stagnation temperature above the above the, the boundary layer. It is important to notice that uh, that uh, for uh, an engineer, right, that is working in hypersonics, 
the important uh, temperature difference when dealing with heat transfer in hypersonics is not the difference between the static temperature and the wall, but the difference between the stagnation temperature and the wall temperature. That's the one that sets the sign of the uh, of, uh, heat into the structure. So one can compute the aerodynamic heat due to friction subject to this standard number that you have to obtain from theory or from simulations or from however you would like. And it is uh, obvious that this uh, slender body, for instance, is going to be subject to very high friction heat fluxes. Whereas this uh, uh, blunt body here in the downstream from the shock is going to be subject to lower uh, friction heat fluxes, heat fluxes uh, mainly because the edge velocity, the edge velocity here is actually much larger than there. And it is because the uh, shock wave is much weaker. It's much weaker here than there. So it's also an important problem for design. There is another type of uh, aerodynamic heating that is important and is related to the stagnation point, for instance, uh, in the nose. This stagnation point uh, phenomenon is actually a low speed. It's actually a low speed phenomenon. So in principle, it's unrelated to hypersonics, even though the chemical composition of this post shock gas, it actually becomes important for the heat transfer characteristics. So the resulting expression, which is a simplification of this Fay-Riddle uh, formula for uh, non-reacting surfaces, can be written like this. And it's actually related to the radius of curvature of the plant nose. So the, the sharper the sharper the nose is, the more heat you will have into the structure. So for that reason, this, for this type of projectile would experience more uh, heat fluxes than this blunt body. So the conservation equations, right? You may be saying, well, what happens with the equations? I haven't seen any equations here. I want a slide full of equations. <laughs> so here it is, here it is, don't, don't worry. So writing the conservation equations for hypersonics would actually take all the entire slides, all the set of slides of the presentation. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to give you a very, very simple, probably the simplest case in hypersonics, right? Simplest case of hypersonics would entail integrating continuity uh, momentum. I'm actually also showing these uh, equations dimensionally uh, because as I told you before, uh, using here dimensionless parameters in principle is not that trivial for, for hypersonics due to the multiple time scales in those thermochemical effects that you saw before. So I would also have to integrate the species conservation equation similar to combustion subject to a reaction term. I would also need to uh, integrate here this uh, total energy equation where uh, total energy is the internal energy plus the kinetic energy subject to pressure work, to work due to the viscous stresses and to a heat flux. And now the question is, how do I define this internal energy? Well, this internal energy is going to be the sum of uh, chemical energy plus translational energy plus vibrational energy plus rotational energy and plus electronic energy. So in principle, those uh, energies, they don't have to be equilibrated. Those molecular motions, they don't have to be equilibrated. And the one that is typically non-equilibrated in the simplest case, again, right? I'm not claiming that this is a general formulation for hypersonics. In the simplest case, it tends to be the uh, vibrational uh, energy. Still, I could use the uh, ideal gas equation, which is defined in terms of the translational temperature, which is the only temperature, is the kinetic temperature of the system. It's the only one that gives rise to a pressure. And on top of that, I could integrate uh, landau teller's model for the vibrational energy, right? Where I would have a transport of vibrational energy plus this source term that you may be wondering, well, how is that thing coming? Uh, where is that thing coming from? Well, it's because Landau was a smart person. <laughs> that's, the, that's the answer. And he has a demonstration for that. So you should believe everything that is written here. But it contains this relaxation term, right? That it is subject to this uh, uh, constant of uh, relaxation which uh, you will have to calculate. So this is a relaxation of the vibrational energy to the equilibrium value that is given by the kinetic energy. So you could integrate this, and for instance, you could do runs. And the problem with runs these days is that uh, even for this flow that does not show uh, much of, uh, of uh, thermochemical e effects, which is just a uh, stagnation density of me one megajoule per kilogram, right? even in this flow, uh, which is a compression corner. Here are the experiments in with these dots, right? That you can see here from Coleman and Stoller. These uh, run simulations, which they tend to they try to measure the dimensionless heat flux. What they tend to do is to overpredict aerodynamic heating, and they tend to overpredict aerodynamic heating because it is known that runs models used for this type of applications they are overly dissipative. So the turbulent dissipation is too much if you put it in the 
in the thermal energy equation, it would rise the temperature a lot. So those uh, subaggregate scale models for the dissipation sometimes also include the Zeeman uh, model for, for high speed flows, right? Some other times include the Sarkar model for compressible turbulence. But there is a lot of work to do in this area, uh, even without taking into account the thermochemical effects. So one thing that we have done at CTR though is to look at uh, hypersonic flows from a different perspective, which is using wall modeling. And Xiang, who is here in the audience, was a pioneer in this uh, here at the center because he was one of the first uh, doing that. So in, this, in our problem that we are handling at the moment, we have a hypersonic laminar boundary layer that is impinged by a shock. And that shock, what it does is to generate a recirculation bubble, right? And then it triggers transition downstream by mechanisms, which are actually the subject of research these days. The fact is that if you have a coarse uh, grid downstream here, you may not be capable of uh, simulating anything or capturing any scale down there. So you will need a, a wall model. And remember, this wall model needs to capture also the monotonicity of the temperature. Well, this is something that we did with the equilibrium wall model that many of you may be familiar with, is to capture that monotonicity that is down here in the wall model layer. And that is thanks to the formulation of the equilibrium wall model that allows you to do that. The equilibrium wall model is simplified because uh, this flow is a low enthalpy flow. This flow and the experiments that they uh, go with it, they are done in facilities that they don't have uh, capabilities for very high enthalpy uh, flows. So we typically deal with the case here in which the temperature is very low. So the gas is quasi perfect, calorically perfect. So you can also predict uh, the uh, Stanton number uh, compared here with direct numerical simulations. So again, for instance, the blue line is the wall model LES and the uh, DNS is in green, right? And the DNS is using a grid of uh, 200 million and the wall model LES is using a grid of 1 million. So, and here you can see the solution for no wall model LES. And you will say, this looks wonderful. Javier is selling me the motorbike here and you know, I have to believe it. Well, please do not believe it yet because actually these things, they have also their, their caveats and we are actually working on this because this is a big challenge. For instance, one big challenge is that uh, the disturbance that you put at the entrance for wall model LES is important and it may not be even supported by the grid of LES. So the solution becomes sensitive to that disturbance which may be different from the experimental disturbance and from the disturbance of the DNS. So dealing with uh, disturbances in facilities is actually a topic of research these days. But uh, we think this is a good beginning. So far all these models, they have been actually, uh, they actually are not equipped with any uh, high enthalpy or uh, active uh, surface uh, phenomena. Like for instance, you have ablation or uh, systems like that. So this question here is a capital question of research in hypersonics these days. I was thinking to do an intermission, at least for five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we can wait. <laughs> do you want to do a, an intermission or do you want to continue? Oh, really? Okay. I have another hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, three seconds of intermission. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions or? No? I could take one, 